Thank you, Sarah. And <clears throat> now I hurry my welcome. Um, first of all, apologies for my voice. I've got a bit of a cold, and I think I've done more talking in the last 36 hours than I've done in about, and I usually do in about a month. Um, so if I'm a little bit gravelly, that's not how I normally sound. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming, and, um, and a thank you to Phosphor G and the organisers. It's been a really good conference, um, and it's really great to be one of the uh, inaugural sponsors. Um, yeah, so um, my name's Hamish, as Sarah mentioned. Um, I am product manager at coordinates.com. Um, who has actually used coordinates at some point? Some hands, all right, that's cool. Um, always nice to know the people using your stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> my background is, you know, I did a degree in physics. Um, I ended up uh, working at uh, Pizza Hut of all places where um, I made a map of, uh, of late deliveries of pizzas. Um, and that was my first sort of foray into the GIS world. And, um, and a friend at an engineering company was saying, uh, hey, you know, our GIS team is developing all this property software. Um, they really need a developer. Why don't you come and join us? And, um, and that was kind of my uh, straight into the deep end introduction to uh, the world of GIS and civil engineering. And that was, um, that was um, 10 years ago now. Um, <clears throat> I've been with Coordinates for nearly eight years. Um, and Coordinates itself has been around for uh, 10 or 11 years. Um, we're a New Zealand founded company, but uh, we're currently spread between Auckland uh, and Wellington in New Zealand and, uh, and Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, just really briefly, what is Coordinates? Um, we are a SaaS product company. Um, we have a pl platform that makes it uh, really easy to publish your spatial data um, and for your users to find and appraise and download the data and access the data that they need um, in the format that they want, at when they want it, in the way that they want it. Um, and so our purpose is to bridge that gap between people who have data who need to get it out to the people who are actually going to use and add value and do good things in the world with it. Um, so like I said, we've been around for, for 10 years in New Zealand and we've been pushing the open data message, um, especially around our early days. We um, we're really passionate about um, the value of open data in government, and we've been lucky in New Zealand to have successive governments who have been very supportive of that message. Uh, we've had the NZ Gold framework, and I believe there's a similar um, Ausgold framework in New Zealand around open access licensing around data, um, and that has um, let us kind of like build a, a, a national market for open data uh, in New Zealand. Um, Um, I would acknowledge as well the, uh, the, that we, uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants with what we do. Um, we are big users and contributors of open source software. Um, in particular, uh, Django, we use a lot of Django, Python, uh, PostGIS, and Postgres. And um, in particular, the GDL framework, I want to really acknowledge Evan, um, who's a real hero in our community. Um, we contribute a lot of code and funky test cases back to them. So, you know, in our position as that sort of broker between uh, publishers and consumers, we get to see lots of interesting edge cases and strange things that people are trying to do with their data, and, um, and so we get to supply uh, um, lots of interesting bits of, um, you know, strange bits of data and test cases back up to those projects. Um, <clears throat> my own background, actually, I, I used to do a lot of uh, work around content management systems, and um, I guess one of my formative <clears throat> experiences was contributing to the Silverstripe um, open source content management system, and I was really lucky to sort of grow as a developer through the... Uh, sort of feedback and uh, learning that happens in that kind of community. So um, it was nice to see that sort of message in the plenary about um, how we can um, help people go from uh, inexperienced to experienced um, open source contributors. Um, and in New Zealand, you know, where do we sit? So our customers are Land Information New Zealand um, and Manaki Whenua, sorry, I don't have your new logo on there, um, who uh, have been with us on this journey for a really long time now. Also, Stats New Zealand, the Ministry for the Environment, and uh, GeoNet New Zealand, the Ministry of Defence. <coughs> um, so, we we kind of are in an in interesting position where, um, as sort of being a vendor neutral kind of company, um, sitting at the sort of uh, national government level um, for a sort of an SDI kind of role. I don't like talking about spatial data infrastructure because it doesn't really feel like um, our role, but it, but we are kind of a de facto SDI. Um, and that gives us a bit of an insight into what are the needs of the users of those systems at a national level. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some high-level slides real quickly, um, some graphs and things about what people are actually doing and what they actually need out of the kind of systems we provide. <clears throat> so there are two main ways you get data out of a coordinates platform. Um, and the first one is via 
exports or data downloads. You know, you go to the site, you select the data you want, you crop it out, you get it in the format that you want. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at you know when people are accessing stuff, well, there's no real surprises. People come into work on Monday morning, they sit down at the desk, you know, they start downloading data, and it's kind of fun to see. You know, um, people get in at eight o'clock, things start to ramp up, and see a bit of a, a, a break around lunchtime. Um, so that's not too surprising. Um, I'm impressed with our, uh, our industry's fortitude at staying right until the end of the day on Friday. Um, I would have thought it would be more of a drop-off on a Friday afternoon, to be honest. Um, um, but, you know, we're working hard. Um, I mean, we do have an export API, right? So we have full APIs around our functionalities. Um, and we do have some users who use that uh, export API capability. Um, FME in particular is sort of one of those automation tools that we, um, you can do the integration. <clears throat> but by and large, people doing desktop analysis are sitting down, they want ad hoc downloads. Um, we can break it down by type. Um, it's 2018, shape file still rule. That's the, that's the sad reality of where we are. Um, it's coming on 30 years. Um, that's, a, you know, it's, I'm a little bit older than that, but not so much older. It's kind of a scary thought. Um, you know, I do wonder if, you know, 30 years from now, um, we'll come and do the same presentation and it will look not so different, maybe. Um, but the other big surprise, um, perhaps when we first started this, uh, this journey, is um, the red one, DWG. Um, a huge, important part of what we do is serving CAD and DWG users. Um, and that's not always on the top of people's priorities when they're provisioning GIS systems. How do you support the CAD users who are doing uh, really important work in the world? Um, then we got file geo database, which um, is sort of representative of the slightly savvier sort of ESRI type users, and uh, KML. It's it's kind of dead. Um, geo package. Uh, very sad to see that, um, despite its qualities as a format and its good support, um, it's still really a really niche kind of uh, product. Um, similarly, on the Rust export side, so we support vector grid and Rust exports, but I've just broken it down to Rust and vector today. Um, we can see that uh, DWG again is like, you know, that's, while DWG is just serving, you know, it's just really packaging up um, JPEG images under the hood, um, it's still a really important way of getting data to people doing work. Um, the other way we can look at it, and this is crude because we don't have really detailed information about, about the sector that people are coming from, but we can make some pretty good guesses based on the main names and things. Um, AEC, or Architecture Engineering Construction, that's where the value is being delivered uh, for us at a national level. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, civil engineering, planning, uh, architecture, all those kind of fields, um, they are like the, the big users of export data. Um, so it's feeding into a lot of project work, basically. Um, followed up by research, so we're talking about universities, um, Crown Research Institutions in New Zealand, <coughs> um, that sort of thing. Um, and then, uh, at a small level, um, agribusiness, um, some intra-government um, sort of work. And I've broken out geospatial specialists. Um, while you know the, a lot of those AEC companies will have their own GIS teams, I wanted to separately break out the specific GIS um, implementing kind of um, agencies because we'll see that they've got a slightly different pattern of usage later. Um, if we look at those two sort of variables next to each other, we can see why they're different. So we can see that in the uh, you know, AEC factor, those are the big DWG users. So all those people building bridges and roads and uh, planning our cities, um, they're huge users of DWG and CAD, sort of not surprisingly really when we say it, um, but they are coming to our national SDIs to grab the data that they need. Um, if they know that they can get it and they know it's reliable and they know it's in the form that they want, then they will come and they will use the data. Um, similarly, at the government level, um, they are um, maybe stuck in the legacy shapefile world, uh, perhaps a little bit. Um, also big file GTB users, which might reflect the uh, sort of dominance of, um, of ESRI maybe in local government in New Zealand perhaps. Um, it would be interesting to see what that would look like if we focused just on Australia um, uh, or other sorts of markets where the dynamics might be different. Um, and then in, uh, in research as well, check files, guys. Um, and then we can do it by uh, raster types as well. And it's a similar sort of pattern where uh, um, You've sort of got agribusiness and AEC where it's all CAD and DWG. And on the other side, government and research where, um, um, where it's all about um, getting JPEGs for display and context and then um, geotiffs, you sort of see the, the importance of being able to get raw data for analysis 
um, more so in the research sector. Um, so the other thing we do is uh, web services. So um, we support WFS and WMTS and um, uh, web coverage and stuff, but I'm just going to focus on WFS um, as sort of a data delivery mechanism um, today. <coughs> um, so we can see the different usage pattern here, right? So whereas people are coming into work to do their exports to their desktop software, what we see with WFS is it's far more about integration and business automation. While people are using some WFS um, into things like QGIS, if we look at things like user agents and stuff, it's almost all sort of uh, automation, nightly processes, that kind of stuff. And it's a smaller user base, so we can sort of see some of the individual patterns coming through a lot stronger. So we can see like people with their nightly update processes. We can see we've got a couple of customers who are doing sort of Monday morning and Tuesday morning um, update processes. A lot of that comes out of uh, data that's updated on a, on, a, on a weekly or monthly sort of basis. And uh, people are kicking off their, uh, their um, workflows to pull in the data um, and integrate it with their internal systems. And it's when you can get your system to be really reliable, people can build stuff on top of it, um, they can chain from doing their sort of downloads into their desktop every morning uh, into an automated workflow. So we look at it by sector as well. So we, we looked at exports by sector, but if we look at WPS by sector, it looks really different. Suddenly, uh, those sort of intra-government links become really important. So you've got councils that need to update their property systems from MIMS, and, um, and so that's like a really important thing for them is to um, be able to sort of synchronize the data between the different um, areas and sort of parts of government. And then we see the geospatial specialists, right? Like, you guys are the integrators, they're uh, building systems that will consume the WFS and make them available for um, their own sort of uh, <coughs> back office sort of workflow processes and serving it out to um, other customers with different products and things. Um, and also sort of specialist technology companies. So we like to put them side by side, you can see the real difference in usage. AEC, research, download the thing. Um, government, geospatial, tech, um, integrating. Um, so some takeaways from those messages, right? Um, DOG and CAD is really important. Um, we need to talk to those people a lot more, understand what they need, support their formats, um, because um, they are spatial users, first class spatial users as well. They tend to be working at different scales a lot of the time, um, but they are absolutely users of the data that we produce and uh, make available. Um, Things like web service versus downloads, they support different markets, we've got to support them both. Um, we can't really pick one and, uh, and, and treat the other one as second class. You know, they're both important parts or aspects of an SDIF type system. Um, and special mention for GeoPackage because it's a really awesome format. It's uh, one of OGC's good things they've got going and sadly it doesn't have a lot of uptake yet. Um, so it'd be cool to see that change. Um, what are we for time? So I've got a couple of minutes, so I wanted to talk a little bit about where we're going with all this and um, what we could, what we potentially see as being the future um, in this kind of uh, field of, you know, how the industry works. <coughs> um, you know, at the moment, this is kind of how we operate and how most data portals and publishing kind of systems operate. Uh, big publishers, lots of consumers. And it's a one-way flow. Um, you know, data creators, data users. That's not really how the industry actually works, though. The industry looks a lot more like this. You've got uh, things like state mapping agencies that, that produce a lot of data, and they consume a little bit. And you've got local governments and data vendors who take that in, they add their own things, some of it goes out, some of it's used internally. Uh, you've got uh, companies and contractors, and at the other end, you've got B2C um, tech um, companies who uh, they might not actually be that GIS savvy, but they consume a lot of data, and they turn it into uh, you know, Uber and you know, routing maps and all that kind of thing. So what we're doing so far doesn't really support this kind of ecosystem of data. Um, and like the reality is that it's 2018, web services have been around for a long time, exports have been around for a long time. They, they both, the user experience of those is not actually that great. Let's be really honest. Going to a website, logging in, clicking download, waiting for the download, it's not actually that great experience. Uh, WFS, web services. Um, they are reliant on network conditions, um, they're reliant on the, the ability of the provider to maintain service levels when um, you know, usage patterns change. Um, it's also not a great experience. Um, it's great if your software 
um, it supports it, but um, how many people here have actually tried to implement a WPS client? It's the worst. Yeah, there we go. <coughs> WPS3 uh, looks a lot better, but it's kind of a variation of theme. Um, but it sounds familiar, right? You know, as a software engineer, we have to deal with grabbing packages of different types of data and merging them together into something. That sounds very similar to how you know, this kind of ecosystem actually works. The data ecosystem looks a lot like the code ecosystem, really, when you look at how people use it. Um, so what if? What if data was a build dependency? What if you could um, you know, have changed that in version tracking and pin different versions to your project? Um, what if you could have a pull request for your project? Um, so this is the stuff we're thinking about really hard right now, and hopefully uh, um, sometime soon we'll be able to come back to a conference like this and talk a bit more about what we're doing. Thanks. Just quickly on that breakdown, were you able to analyse what was being served out by geography? So within the country or internationally, or if internationally, what areas internationally? Um, we could. I mean, we're very so, we're very New Zealand sort of centric at the moment. Um, so it would have been, you know, here's New Zealand, uh, here's a population map of New Zealand kind of kind of view. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to have a look because um, we do sort of have things like um, when there's a large sort of imagery release, for example. Well, that that's when there are international players who are very interested in maintaining their sort of global coverage of stuff. Um, yeah, we could. Yeah.